<laughs> oh, I haven't put the set the thing on the beginning of that. Yeah. I've just put it on play. On the plays, yeah. Um, just, no, that's I'm fine. Just like, yeah. Wait, let's just start straight away and discuss because yeah. extra five seconds. Cause we're so excited. Yeah, a- apparently, yeah. <laughs> apparently, because we've been told that we're excited. Hmm. Anyway, that'll do for an opening. Yeah. Um, okay, so we're going to do the episode two of Discuss now, which uh, is a term which I've coined myself, so it's not a legitimate thing, but I hope it catches on, uh, which is called cookie cutter music. And what I mean by this is basically music that fits a cliche so well that it becomes okay, average, when in fact it could be really good music. I mean, the prime example of this is a, from a game that I did, I played, sorry. Um, how, how long ago was it? It was Ori in the Blind Forest. It must have been uh, a couple of months now, six yeah, months maybe. Yeah, St- yeah, start of the year sometime. Yeah, yeah. Um, Ori in the Blind Forest It was basically you're this weird little um, furry light dude who runs around forests at mega speed trying to save a tree. And uh, the music in that was really good. Like, uh, I can listen to it and say, like, oh, this is actually really good music. But in the context of what it was, it ended up being quite average in the game because it fits so well that it, you could pass it off as just any other soundtrack in that same genre. Mm. Uh, and it, that's why I came up with the whole concept of cookie cutter music because it was a brilliant soundtrack, but its context ended up detracting from it. And that's what we're going to talk about today, the whole idea of cliches in music and this, uh, this idea of whether they're good or bad. So, uh, yeah, we'll, the, uh, we'll look at the beginning of cliches, I guess, now. Um, mm. the, we'll the, go back what, as yeah, far as we can. Back as far as we can and uh, see how these cliches work. I apologize in advance if I'm sounding a little groggy. I'm a bit ill. Um, after a, a couple of days ago, I, just, I got struck down considerably with uh hell's disease but i'm good now hopefully <laughs> we'll see how i go uh and see how my memory keeps up with me as i'm going along it's all right it could could be a shorter could be a short recording we could be fine yeah no. well, um, richard has pulled through marvelously um we were originally going to postpone this recording and he said no let's do this i'm good so, yeah well yeah, i now. woke up this morning and didn't cry <laughs> that's, that's always a good thing to happen <laughs> when you wake up in the morning oh yeah yeah well it's back to normal not I crying guess, yeah of. uh but yeah anyway uh let's start talking about cliches music, and music yeah uh well back in the day we're not going really going to talk much about the the ness snes mega drive era because no. that was all bleeps and blues we're, we're looking mu- we're looking later than that yeah um, yeah because the the there weren't that many cliches in that that was all unless you count retro music as a cliche in which case the entire <laughs> uh area yeah. of time was one huge cliche how, how dare which, they yeah yeah oh man <laughs> um which we're, we're gonna say no to that so no. we're just gonna no. leave that um, and just keep moving it, on it, to it, it, it definitely in the context of that time absolutely not you know mm. you might argue in a modern case that there is a cliche that's developed but you know i think that's that's a different discussion as well. That's not really related to yeah. the cliches that we're talking about yeah. uh, or going to be talking about in this yeah. discussion. And to, to some extent, like we'll probably might at the end anyway when we start talking about modern cliches. Because like I said, retro music has become a cliche uh, in this day's context when a game is made with kind of mm. uh, retro graphics, as they Pixel, say, which yeah. is a fancy word for lazy, um, <laughs> which is my, well, my opinion, of course. Uh, <laughs> Well, it's a it's a complex issue. I think we'd have to we'd have to look at that one in more detail. Um, yeah, that's, that's not what this is about. about but about I, that, I yeah. could easily talk for a good ten minutes on why I think most retro oh, sure. games of today sure yeah yeah are just lazy graphics. But anyway, yeah. Um, we'll we'll talk more about like the PlayStation N sixty four era to begin yeah. with because back then there was a lot of um, cute and cuddly games. Like is what you would call them. You know, like yeah. Mario and Banjo Kazooie and Crash Bandicoot and Sonic and uh, all the all the the um, animal mascot. Well, besides Mario, animal mascots, <laughs> animal and um, human mascots. Yeah, yeah, and they all um, followed th- these ideas of like worlds um, in each of them, and there there were things like the typical lava 
ice, forest, um, space, all that sort of stuff. And they all had their specific cliches within music. So if I, um, as composers with each other, if I said to Stefan, what would you uh, think of in terms of music if I said, write me an ice world? Like, what would you do? Well, I'd definitely be looking at, um, you know, a lot of kind of uh, tuned percussion instruments. You might mm. look at your... Um, your xylophones or your glocks or mm. something like that. Um, uh, and it can be other things. I've also, um, I've also used things like, um, you know, you can use like pizzicato string chords. Um, there are a few different options, but you generally got that kind of um, uh, ringy, attacky the, Yeah, music. the chimey yeah, sounds. That chimey yeah, sound. That's, yeah, that's what I would say as well. I'd say straight up like glockenspiel, celeste. The, uh, the chimey sounding tuned percussion mm. and then some of the non chimey tuned percussion as well like uh, triangle yeah, or your metallic tinky out. sounds yeah yeah um, and then then like strong string lush chords are usually a thing as well when, especially if there's like an uh, arctic wasteland type thing yeah. they're usually used a lot um, light use of horns is used frequently yeah um, it can be yeah woodwinds the non reeds, sure. Yeah, I mean uh, reeds are a no, I think, for ice. But yeah, flute, piccolo, maybe a mm. bit of clarinet if you're so inclined. I, I think the combination of flute and clarinet, mm. um, in particular, is one that is used when, uh, particularly when they need a fuller orchestration. Mm. Um, uh, yeah, it, I mean it. Ice that the kind of ice cliche, let's mm. call it, is is probably one of the more varied ones. Mm. I mean there are. Um, I think it's more of a general sound than like a definite set of instruments mm. that he used. But um, yeah, definitely they're all valid options. There. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if they do it well, of course. I mean, yeah. the, the, we've talked about it before. My favorite kind of, um, easy way of doing a Christmas or ice world is just do the exact same thing, but with sleigh bells on top, <laughs> which is which is rubbish, obviously. But yeah. I, I, you know, yeah. it's what some people do. I would love to just make a joke thing of that. Do the do like. Um, I don't know, Call of Duty Christmas edition and just have the exact same sound. Oh, I don't actually know what the soundtrack is for Call of Duty because the music's rubbish. Do Halo <clears> Christmas <throat> edition. Um, yeah, Halo. I, I know the Halo music. Halo <laughs> music Christmas edition is just the exact <laughs> theme, but with sleigh bells on top. Easy I can, peasy. I can hear it in my Million head already. Views. There we go. Sorted. <laughs> Patent pending. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's a good example of ice things. And there's plenty of examples in games that actually do that. Mm. I mean, um, the Christmas... Mu Christmas? The, the ice slash snow music in Mario 64, for example, has this whole sleigh bell thing over yeah. the top of it as it's... Um, I don't know I don't know what the uh, sound font was that was used, but it kind of sounds like an accordion, I guess. Yeah. Very much so, yeah. Mm. Yeah, um, um, but the sleigh bells are the thing that makes it very, very snow-like. Mm. And then there's a uh, freeze easy peak. For yeah, that, that's, that's my again, always big example. That's um, again very Christmassy sounding. Um, yeah, there's plenty, plenty, plenty yeah. others which I can't remember now. Uh, but yeah, let's use another example. If yeah. I said to you forest theme, what would you say? Forest theme is is an interesting one. I, I guess the the big thing that comes to mind are the kind of wind uh pipes like pan pipes mm. kind of thing in particular um percussive as well mm. um there's probably a bit of overlap with the kind of um uh, another one that w that we've talked about before is the kind of jungle mm. music which is very mm. much that kind of um bongo yeah that kind of thing. log loggy kind of sound yeah, i'll call yeah. it um uh but yeah, those those are the big ones for me. Wind, you kind of have this low percussive percussive sound underneath, and then essentially like woodwind instruments on the top. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, well, that's those are my yeah. thoughts. Yeah, yeah. forest um, is one of those ones where you kind of got to ask what kind of forest. Yeah, um, like you said, because jungle is very different to forest. And if you are doing enchanted forest versus dead forest, very different things. Whereas if you did like dead Iceland place versus Enchanted Iceland Place, they're not really going to be that mm. different. Um, but yeah, forest, it, very much, it's always woodwinds, pretty much, in uh, forest-based areas. And to some extent, um, like I said, 
percussiony bass sections. Yeah. Uh, and Rhythm, rhythms vary depending lot. on, like your kind of beat will mm. vary, I think, depending on that kind of context. Mm. But um, yeah, there's very much like layering, similar layering to the forest itself. Um, yeah, have, like, uh, yeah I see what you did there. Earthy sounds down the bottom. Yeah, I um, see what you, I see what you did. Yeah, yeah, and like I said, depends on the context of the forest as well. Because sure. I think um, one example that always sticks with me in my head is uh, from a game called Eternal Sonata, which was a what was it? It was Xbox, oh, Xbox 360 slash PS3 era. Yeah, stage. it's kind so of. It's a bit further on from what I'm saying, but it's a good example because at the start, it's one of those uh, JRPGs that you walk in a straight line forever. And uh, it, but it's all kind of painted differently, so it looks like you're going somewhere. Mm. But you have to go through this forest multiple times because that's where the main character is. Um, which, if I s- explain the story briefly, you're Chopin, you're dying, you have some weird ass dream, and that's pretty much the story. Uh, but the weird ass dream is where you're Chopin with like this conducting baton that you stab people with. And it's like, well, all right. And yeah, it's one of those JRPGs that you're just like, I'm a wizard with a yeah. hat on, and you're apparently Chopin, but that's about as close as to Chopin's life as you get. It was, hey, you yeah, know, I don't like... know. It just, I played I play it through one and a half times because I stopped halfway through because I was just like, oh, <laughs> some, of, some of the Japanese cliches in there were just like, oh, I don't like it. Mm. But I, I persevered and got through. But anyway, the forest at the start, you have to go through like dozens of times. And it it sometimes rains, it sometimes doesn't, but the music significantly changes. Um, whenever it does rain, it doesn't like there's much, it's much more, as you said, an earthy sound when it's raining because the higher register has to be taken up with the rain sound. Yeah. So using higher registered stuff would probably just well, it's probably sound alright, but it would get in the way of the rain sound, um, which. Rain is one of those special sounds that uh, you don't want to get in the way of. It's one of those ones which people can listen to without music and they'd be fine with it. Oh, sure, um, yeah. One of those magic sounds that you've got to get right every time, mm. um, which is good, which is hard, I guess, unless you're actually doing rain. Oh, very um, much so, yeah. Or as the uh, the secret Foley uh, stuff is, it's, it's salt on yeah. paper, isn't it? That's the uh, secret... Um, Secret Foley technique. Secret. Uh, which yeah. Foley techniques is uh, making sounds out of things that aren't the things that you want to hear. Does that yeah. make sense? So, like I said, you use rain as salt on paper. If you want to get someone's head exploding, you punch a cabbage. It's the, the things like that. That's what Foley sounds yeah, are. It, it's a it's a fascinating topic. We won't talk about it much here because it's mm. a bit off topic. But it is a fascinating um, thing to look into, mm. even if you just kind of. There's plenty to even just Google on the internet about yeah, how yeah. they uh, they make various folly sounds. Yeah, so, and yeah. we've done a few ourselves, and it's it's not too bad. <laughs> excuse no, it's you. Fine. Yeah, excuse me. I nearly choked on my water there. Mm-hmm. We're all good. <laughs> yeah. So the whole forest thing is a much bigger variation, but ultimately there's always bits that are typical in all forest stages. Mm. My example is a bit later than what we're talking about, um, but earlier examples. Do you have any? Um, forest one, like, you're kind of, uh, uh, well, the Zelda. Yeah, yeah, Zelda, we'll talk about I, suppose, Zelda. Yeah. I mean, uh, we've already talked about Zelda last time, but Ocarina of Time, Lost Woods is very Ocarina. Yeah. Sound and, uh. Well, that's it, and you have that. Yeah, yeah, and the whole the, the kind of look. So, um, you know, that's a good example. Yeah, um, that's probably the best example for forest and then, like, you know, if, if we look at a different context, uh, if you kind of take the jungle extension of that, then you would need to look no further than uh, Donkey Kong. Oh, yeah, of course, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah and I mean, you know, that's they like they that. really embrace those in the later games. But um, mm. yeah, you know, that's kind of the stereotypical jungle vibe right there. Um, yeah, yeah, the kind of um, syncopated massive percussion type thing yeah, yeah. yeah you're right That's a, that was a good example yeah I forgot about Donkey Kong I was busy thinking I was like Mario doesn't have any jungle levels <laughs> or forest levels mm. I was like, oh no I'm running out of ideas <laughs> Crash Bandicoot oh but I've forgotten his music uh, um, it's, yeah, yeah it's a hard one um Mm. I suppose Crash Bandicoot's music never really stuck with me from the games that I did well, play of it but yeah the only one I can remember is actually the, the running away levels because that one just that I always remember the bum 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 Oh, yeah, that's right. Ooh, thing. 
Yeah. That's the only one I can remember, though. And it was in the forest, so I was like, mm-hmm. can't remember the music. Mm. But anyway, there's some good examples. Yeah. We'll do one more that's example um, of a cliche. So uh, if I, I said uh, city slash industrial type area, what would you... Have? Well, I mean, the, fir- the first thing that comes to mind with industrial is metallic. Mm. Um, so again, percussion features uh, in this, um, but you have your kind of bigger... Bigger percussion sounds are very heavy. Um, mm. So, like, oh. well, you'd be looking at like your kind of anvil sounds or things like mm. that. Maybe not earlier on, they would have used different mm. things, but um, you could probably get away with some synth sounds as well there. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I'd, again, context varies whether you're looking at like um, just a kind of say modern day industrial era city or whether mm. you're going futuristic um, as did happen sometimes in the sci-fi games you'd obviously be looking more towards synthesizers and mm. things like that um, uh, yeah I guess that's the big one for me um, yeah I think synth synth is the big thing for city slash industrial because you're no longer in nature so acoustic is not a thing mm. um, cities are very much man-made so we've got to have our man-made sounds which are synthesized stuff and uh, you see it everywhere, like every city slash industrial thing. You don't hear uh, solemn strings in the middle of a street, do you? You usually hear like uh, uh, no. some, maybe some kind of uh, urban, inverted commas, sounds, you know, R&B type uh, beat going on. It happens. Maybe, yeah, yeah it depends. Yeah, yeah, yeah like again, it, depends or on just the context like for, of the game. Or just dance yeah. music sometimes, you know, there's um, Jet Set Radio, that's a good oh, example. Very of, true, uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, an urban thing because it's literally all urban. <laughs> um, what else is there? There, um, well, would I count Sonic the Hedgehog? Not really. the later three D ones. It certainly has urban settings, but the, the music's kind of. I don't know. Sonic's a special case because music was all over the place mm. in that regard. But I guess even if you look at the early Sonic games, there is, uh, uh, you know, when you look at. Um, Later zones in games like the Metropolis zones mm. in in the older Sega um, games, mm. you know, they very much kind of tie into that whole cliche. There might mm. not be as directly obvious a split in those games between the different levels because obviously in the Sega days, you know, a lot of it was uh, those kind of um, synthesizer era sounds, even mm. in the, the early levels. Um, but I think very much, you know, that they kind of fit in with that. Um, yeah, 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 sure. Uh, yeah, so there's some examples. I'm sure there's millions of other examples we can come up with, but we, we might as well carry on because um, in modern game context, there's obviously a huge spectrum of what a game is because well, the areas we were talking about, or the areas of time, sorry, we were talking about, um, mu- games were in very specific uh, or in a very specific position. It, it wasn't like um, the adventure game had such a huge spectrum. It was, the adventure game was always... A Zelda ripoff, effectively. Oh, definitely. Uh, yeah. If, and... if it was a if it was a platformer, it was always a Mario ripoff. Whereas today, saying adventure game is extremely vague. You can't say, "Oh, this is an adventure game," because that means nothing mm. anymore. Like the, the the range that we have of games is huge, and as a result, it's the same with the music. The the amount of uh, or and style of game music is huge now, but cliches still exist. Uh, they just manifest in different uh, sounds. Sure. I guess. Yeah. So, what would be a good example of uh, modern music cliche in games, or maybe a genre that has always the same music, effectively? Oh well, I guess. Um... Well, I, I guess we'll probably start by by looking at um, a very prevalent game genre today, which is the shooter, the first person uh, yeah, shooter. Yeah, of course. Um, uh, you know, there's very much uh, cliches in a different form in those. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you know, we're not we're not looking so much at these cliched instrumentations to a certain degree. Mm-hmm. I will add as a caveat because you know you do have you do have cliched sounds within that, but um, you know, I think the the to to start very broadly before we drill down into this, you know, the the big. Um, kind of factor in the in the shooter cliche music for me is is the idea of kind of action and speed and and yeah that yeah. that the, the, kind of tension in the music the hollywood trailer sound yeah very mu- very much so um yeah. 
so, well, I mean, you know, we, we'll look at some of the, the techniques kind of later on, but, you know, you have this... I think the... Rather than, you know, we can say, oh, these instruments define the shooter genre, mm. I think it's very much this kind of fast-paced yeah, um, yeah. music. Yeah, well, that's that's the uh, the change from uh, cliche to cliche, I guess, because mm. back in the day when we were talking about the examples, it was always, what instrumentation is it? But now it's like, what's the vibe? Yeah, what's the what's sound? What's the feel? Yeah. Um, and Shooters is a good example because there's a lot of soundtracks that are potentially good, but, you, you know, they fit so well into it that it, you know, they just sound average. I think the best way to think it, about it is if I gave you a name of a, a game that you've played and you can remember the soundtrack, that's a good soundtrack. Mm. If you don't remember it, but you enjoyed the game, that's a cliche soundtrack that worked, but... Or cookie... No, my word is cookie cutter. Cookie cutter, yeah. Cookie cutter soundtrack that uh, worked, but you're not going to remember the soundtrack. Yeah. So if... Um, God, I don't remember what shooters you've played and I've played at the same time. Uh, well, Halo. Do you remember the music of Halo? I remember bits from Halo, I will okay. admit. Like, and ironically, I couldn't recall to you uh, any probably of the in-game music. I remember the, the theme music, obviously, and yeah. the menu music. Yeah. Um, but I would be at a loss. And I will I will say that like, I, I haven't played a lot of the Halo mm. games. I have played them all, mm. but um, not having kind of owned them myself, mm. I didn't spend a lot of time on them. But mm. yeah, very much, very much. I couldn't, I couldn't relate to large parts of the score. Yeah, from- uh, Halo is probably a bad example to start with because it is the one with the most iconic soundtrack. <laughs> yeah, um, but, z- yeah, but again, you know, I think um, uh, just to just to kind of go back on that, like uh, there are there are a lot of. Um, yeah, the, you know the, mm. the theme song and that that yeah. kind of area of it is is very well known and iconic. But you yeah, know, there's there's a lot else within that. Like mm. I to I wouldn't be able to to relate or re- recall that soundtrack to the degree that I can recall yeah. a lot of others. Yeah, um, well, not in the genre at least. Yeah. I mean, if if you answer the simple yes or no, if I say um, any of the Call of Duties, do you remember the music? No. <laughs> Good start. <laughs> um, what about the Killzone series? Mm, I'm going to say no. Yeah. Again. I don't remember any of that music yeah. at all. Uh, I just remember the, the stabbing animation was really stupid in the oh, first one. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, what else? Uh, Bulletstorm music? No, I will say um, I'm not very familiar with the game. But, yeah, but again, you know, like, the if, point. You, if, yeah. Yeah, if you have any kind of idea, it's just like, oh, or mm. not. But in this case, Bulletstorm, yeah, again, music's all right, but I don't remember any of it because it fits so well. It's just It just uh, molds together into this weird cloud of what I think a shooter music is mm. in my head. Um, Gears of War? Oh, definitely not, no. Okay. But I think <laughs> I, I'm guessing that might be yeah. an exception with you there. <laughs> yeah, well, Gears of War is the one for me that, uh, besides Halo, is recognizable. Mm. Um, but I think that ties back into something we talked about last podcast, which was making Tambra mm. um, catchy. Because I couldn't tell you the, the, the music whilst you're fighting, as you said with Halo. But I can give you the exact sound that happens the moment you turn on the game. So, do 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 do. It, it doesn't right. yeah, sound yeah. like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, everyone knows that sound the moment you do it. Like if uh, if Microsoft were going to release a trailer for Gears of War Four soon, they could ha- just have a black screen and then put that sound on. Everyone would go whoa because <laughs> they know exactly what it is. Mm. Um, so in that regard, that's very well written. And then everything else just fits into what we're talking about, where it's kind of glued and yeah. uh, fits into the exact shooter category, which, um, you know, is, well, good, I guess. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's it. Like, we we need to constantly uh, tell everyone listening that we're not saying cliche music's bad. It's actually good. No, and um, I, I guess the other thing that, that uh, we need to mention with this topic is that uh, you know, in the world of scoring and and making music for this purpose, no, you can't for every single game that is made. You can't mm. always, um, you know, have a soundtrack that is full of of completely new, you know, uh, you know, spectacular composed, spectacular music. composed music. Like a, a lot of the time, you know, development timeframes are very short, mm. and uh, you know. Cliche music in itself 
you know, the the genres and the the instrumentations and things, they're not inherently bad in themselves. Mm. They can just be applied well or applied badly. And a lot of the time, even if we might not say a soundtrack is spectacular, but it could still be, work and be effective for what mm. it's doing if it's been composed quickly and it kind of uses some of these. At, at the end of the day, any cliche, and we're not, th- this isn't specific to music, um, you know, this is, this is kind of throughout any of the creative arts, any th- cliche that arises is born out of, uh, you know, there's a reason for it that mm. it's become so prevalent. And normally that is because it in itself is quite effective. Mm. It just becomes overused or whatever. Um, yeah, for sure. So, you know, I think that's a, that's probably a point that we needed to make. Yeah, at this, yeah. At this point in time. Yeah, yeah, because we're, we're going to go into more kind of what sounds like taking huge dumps on stuff when in fact yeah. we're not. We're just critiquing it. We've all, and we should also say, like, we do. A lot of these games that we talk about, we have enjoyed the games mm. and uh, it didn't ruin it for us or no, anything no, like no, that. No. We're just being very objective and critical. Here. Yeah, that's it. Like, cliches are great. They help me a lot when someone says, do this. And yeah. I'm just like, okay, I know exactly what to do. And it's really good for beginners as well because I've helped um, tutor a few people. Like, it's a good thing to go, like, write me a forest theme because mm. then the cliche is there for them to learn from. Yeah. Which is always great. So, yeah, cliches are good. Yeah. Tick. And I, I, will, up. I will say on that as well, just before we move on, like, I myself was very, like, I used to be of the opinion that, uh, not just for cliches, but, um, uh, you know any any kind of tools that utilize mm. phrases or things like that. Mm. I used to be very much of the opinion. I'd look at them and be like, "Oh well, that's just cheating." Mm. Like you know, I'd never use those things because it's cheap and it's. A, but once you start, um, once you start having to work to deadlines and timeframes mm. and things, you realize why these things exist. They don't exist to cheapen the music. They mm. exist because they are very good tools and they save you a lot of time. Mm. That you quite often don't have mm. um, when you need to finish a project. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I, again, it's it's just a case of using them properly and effectively and not, uh, you know, not relying on them in a bad way, but using them for their intended purpose, which is to save you a lot of mm. time. Yeah, yeah. And no, back in the day of university elitism. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> oh, very yeah. much so, oh, yeah. yeah I was, this is, no, in fact, I was worse, actually, uh, in terms of that. I was just like, Ugh. Tonality, gross. Um, <laughs> yeah, but no, I'm reformed now. It's all good. Uh, but anyway, let's move on. Like, we've talked enough about shooters and cliches. Yeah. Um, the, another, another quick example of modern game music cliche, I'll quickly say, is uh, the indie epic type thing, um, which is where Ori and the Blind Forest falls into. Mm. Um, like I said, Ori and the Blind Forest, the music's fantastic, but it fits so well that it, it just become it detracts. The cliche detracts from it. And uh, I think the reason for that is because if I superimposed, say, um, Dust and Elysian Tales soundtrack over it, mm. probably wouldn't notice that I've changed the soundtrack when playing and vice versa um, because they fit into the the epic indie um, genre. And that's what I'm talking about in terms of that. Like, again, the Dust soundtrack is really, really good, like very well done, but it fits too well mm. <laughs> that it just, the cliche detracts. Yeah which is a shame. Um, but yeah, one more example, I guess, of a more modern thing is the horror sound. Oh, yeah. Um, which we've talked about um, outside of this podcast. Yeah, and you know, it's it's maybe something that would be cool to come back into mm. in more detail later on. But, mm. um, you know, it's it's one that's always stood out to me. Um, you know, we, we talked back, uh, you know, we can look right back to the, the Silent Hill games, obviously, mm. as being the the kind of genesis and, and the shaping of, of this cliche in game music. Mm. But I suppose for me, the the examples are really the modern ones of, um, uh, you know, they've, they've probably come over from, from kind of the film mm-hmm. um, conventions into games. But, you know, we have... We have pretty uh, pretty cool uses of, of like, string effects. Um, mm. Aleatoric. Aleatoric yes. stuff. Um, Which means uh, random basically yeah <laughs> it, in the context of games it pretty much means dead space <laughs> yeah that's um, it like yeah um when i first learned about aleatoric it took me like a month to remember what aleatoric actually meant yeah. but aleatoric basically means random effects so like you said dead space you, you tell the string section play any note between 
these bits and uh, you know shake yeah. vigorously or something like that. I guess, I guess if you wanted to sum it up in a few words, I'd, I'd probably say it as controlled chance. Yeah. Um, so we have, uh, you know, we have the spectrum of chance music. Um, you know, obviously, if zero is kind of the your traditional orchestrated, mm. written out, no no variables music, mm. you know, you can go right along the spectrum to your kind of uh, cage, cagey and, you know, everything is everything random. Is random. Um, and they, you yeah, know, the in-between stuff yeah. like uh, Lotus Lasky, um, his Chain 3. Chain 3 non, is... Non-game-wise, yeah. but here's a little piece to listen to. Chain 3 for orchestras. Really chain 3 is a fantastic piece. Because it's a yeah. piece that uh, has no tempo. It just says play these bits and then when you get to this note hold it until everyone else gets there and then continue mm. um and it's a really effective sound because everyone kind of sounds like they're pulling off each other when they're not it's it's a good uh, example sure of yeah what we're talking about yeah um and then there's the extreme stuff like dead space and yeah uh, outside of games penderecki well uh, yeah I th- you know penderecki and dead space have a very strong connection mm. um particularly if you look at Penderecki's Threnody, um, you know, apart from being his kind of, mm. um, <laughs> you know, quintessential. shining quintessential yeah. piece, um, you know, I think, um, uh, what's his name? Jason Graves. Um, Jason Graves, that's the dude. Yeah, uh, you, you know, was, I would assume that he was looking at stuff like that very much when he was applying those mm. techniques to, to Dead Space. Um Again, it's something I'd love to talk about in more detail because mm. you could really go down in depth into the game and how he uses that. But, you know, if you think about these kind of really, particularly the high pitched string effect, mm. I think is a very uh, kind of uh, a, a very good example that stands out. This yeah. kind of non pitch, non specific string sound. Um, mm. Dead Space is a really good example of how effectively it's been used. But that also follows through into other games. Uh, another example I was mentioning before for me that really stands out is. Um, that little that little string stab in Bioshock Infinite. Whenever mm. you finish a combat area and you get that kind of yeah. dun, 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 <laughs> on, the, on the strings, um, uh, you know that's that's very stereotypical. And then uh, you know just just briefly, there are other markers mm. to the horror sound. You have these kind of low, uh, unstable atmospheric sounds that also mm. are added in quite often, um, and and the non musical kind of sounds as well. You know. Uh, grinding metal or yeah. you know wind sounds or yeah something back like that. to Anything the to, Silent Hill sounds yeah. with just like weird ass very heavily reverbed percussion type yeah. thing um, yeah okay we'll, we'll move on because I horror music's my forte and if I digress I'm going to be digressing yeah. for hours about that we will we will come back to it at some mm. point in the future but the the, the Silent Hill thing's actually quite important because uh, we also want to talk about uh, the like you said the tools that we use Mm. and how they shape these cliches because um recently we again we discussed this prior but a a a sound uh, a sample library company Company, yeah yeah i can remember my words (laughs) uh called sound iron uh, recently about maybe a month or so ago um showed off some of their old stuff which is Uh, abstract percussion but they did it saying like this is how you can make that silent hill theme with our libraries i was like oh okay that's interesting um not only because you could do it but also because that sound that very typical sound is pretty much what everyone's going to do with those sample libraries Mm. and there's a lot of sample libraries that do that they they have a sound in that library that you can use that for like one thing and that's it. Mm. I mean, some of them in the title, it, it says that. Sure, yeah. I mean, it, uh, an example of that would be Sonic Kinetics Arabic Strings <laughs> Phrase Sample Library, which, uh, as the name suggests, you can use it for Arabic-type sounds and Middle Eastern desert-type stuff, but that's essentially it. Like, that mm. is the cliche right there and then. That... Um, uh, what, what was the... Uh, what's the theory behind Arabic music? It's like one of the modes in... Oh, like your kind of dominant Phrygian. That's the one. Yeah. Dominant Phrygian. <laughs> Thank you. Um, dominant Phrygian. I just remember Triton. And yeah. that's, that's essentially it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that, that's one of the... That you can only do that with that sample library and it does that with a lot of other libraries. Mm. I'll briefly say what I was talking about when I say phrase libraries as well because there's two types of libraries yeah. in general. The sample and phrase. Sample is where they give you each individual note, effectively. Think of it like Lego blocks. 
Uh, and phrase libraries are where they give you sampled phrases. So uh, they give you the Lego blocks, but they're already glued together, effectively. Um, so fra yeah, phrase libraries give you have the melody, but sample libraries you've got to make the melody. Mm. That's essentially it. And that's why the Arabic strings phrase library um, you can only use Arabic stuff with it because it's already recorded with those specific scales in mind. Um, give me another example of a library. Ah, are we talking phrase libraries here? No, 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 uh, just what we've written on our iPad in front of us. Oh, of course, yeah. Sorry, I was, <laughs> I was off the thing there. Well, I think um, I think the big library that we want to talk about in this regard is mm -hmm. um, another sound iron library um, mm -hmm. called Frendo, mm -hmm. which is basically it's a crazy instrument they made themselves, which is consists of like a, a bass it's drum. It's like a bass drum that's been, in a log. Yeah, in a log wire. that's been like consumed in barbed wire. And yeah, they did some weird stuff to it. And uh, it's yeah, cool. Oh, the, the sounds are amazing because you know they have they've done a lot with it. They have a mixture mm. of like bowed sounds and hit sounds. They've mm. used different mouth. They've done their typical kind of deep sampling thing, yeah. um, which has some very cool effects. But mm. I, I think the thing about Frendo, and you know, I've used Frendo in a few things just for mm. the the effects can be used really well out of context. But I think they mm. very much have been used in. Well, we'll go back to the horror, 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 context, and horror. That's because um, that's Frendo's where they've kind of ended up. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, the example we always use Frendo as our example to people who don't know about this when talking to them in the real world, uh, because we played through Dead Island together along with uh, one of our couple, other friends. Yeah. Or it was a couple. A couple of remember. our friends, yeah. Um, but we were going through, and we were in the uh, swimming pool um, hotel the resort hotel, area, yeah. and uh, Stefan just goes like. Is that Frendo right here? And then we stopped and listened to like, oh yeah, it is. <laughs> and then we could hear exactly what Frendo samples are used throughout that whole section of Dead Island. Mm. It was crazy. But that's funny because we do that a lot now that we're very invested in sample libraries. I mean, uh, with the horror theme, once Dead Space had come out, all these uh, aleatoric string sample libraries started coming out. Mm. And uh, again, you can tell which ones are which. You know, you hear this, and you're like, well, that's this one. Yeah. And uh, yeah, there's plenty of others as well. There's lots of um, aleatoric type things like the Cage series from ADO. Um, some of Spitfire's, um, what are they called? Albion yeah. music. Like the, the third one was all about low stuff, and there was a lot of aleatoric stuff in that. The Uist was all about the kind of uh, evolving uh, stuff like that. Mm. It was, uh, yeah, like if you hear those, if you know those samples, you're going to hear them in the games when they're played. Oh, sure. Um, mm. And I think that's a, it's a necessary kind of evil, unfortunately, with mm. those kind of libraries. I mean, I know as, um, I know with the two of us mm. in particular, um, because we spend a lot of time at, at uni kind of... Uh, mm. Uh, you know, exploring instruments and and utilizing mm. a lot of the extended techniques and interesting sounds. One one continual, I'll call it a frustration that mm. that I get with sample libraries is that you it's rare to find libraries that record those. Mm. But firstly, record those, and secondly, do it well. Mm. Um, so you know, we do we do get really excited when these libraries come out that explore mm. these kind of effects because they're they're unusual and quite often they're the sound that you want. But when you're not, when you don't have the luxury of being able to record it yourself mm. um, with in, with real instruments, it can be quite frustrating. The trade-off being that when those libraries do come out and you get them, they're by their very nature uh, quite inflexible. And essentially, when you recall a sample, you know, when you when you're working with a, just a conventionally sampled instrument, you know, you can, to the extent that the recording allows you to, you can. Mm add things together, change them, you know, change the flow of the the velocities and the mm. dynamics and things like that. Whereas with the phrase library, you're stuck to pretty much how it sounds. Yeah, it's exactly. It. it basically, they become one-offs and then they fuel the cliches that we're talking about. Yeah. Which is unfortunate. I mean, it's getting better. I mean, the uh, Uist, the example I've just given from Spitfire, is actually does a much better job of uh, making something that's more usable. Mm. But uh, there's still a long way to go, I think, in that regard. Oh, sure, yeah. Um, yeah, but a good example of a, a library that fuels that um, 
cliche, that fuels the cliches is actually uh, Symphobia by mm. Project Sam. It's, again, not a diss on that library. No, Those great library. Good. Yeah. But uh, the, an example outside of games is the Lost soundtrack. Any music that wasn't done by um, Michael Watts' face. Michael Giacchino. That's the one. Say that to the mic so you can hear it. Michael Giacchino. <laughs> That's the one. Okay. Um, yeah, the music wasn't done by him. I don't know who did it, but it was 90% one-shots from mm. um, Symphobia. And it earned a lot of ridicule from the composing uh, community because it was like you literally pressed one button to make this music. So, sure, yeah. yeah. And, and such a shame um, when, you know, to, to kind of, you know, you have a composer like that working mm. on a show. Who, like his his stuff is fantastic. Mm. Um, I, I love like pretty much all of his soundtracks that he does. Mm. Um, I, I've still been listening through a bit of... Um, Inside Out, um, yeah. which I went to see a little while ago. Um, mm. But yeah, to have to have a composer like that work through, you know, write fantastic sounding music. And in, in that kind of vein that we've been talking about as well, you know, there's very much these kind of off-kilter sounds in mm. there to, to you know, kind of to pair that with you know, mm. literally button presses from yeah. from a preset library is is kind of yeah very disappointing. Well, the thing is, the the larger fan base don't realize it. Oh, so the people for sure, actually yeah. watching, which will be a future thing we'll talk about. Yeah, I don't want to talk about <laughs> no, no. composing and all that. But yeah, anyway, that's a good example of a, a phrase library that fuels the cliches. But then sometimes cliches just are born from their own, and then sample libraries are built to fit those cliches. Mm. I mean, if anyone who actually makes music knows of ADO, they pretty much you can tell what is popular by what they release. Yeah, because uh, when dubstep became a thing, and then when dubstep became a thing in trailer music, they suddenly started releasing loads of dubstep uh, sample packs, and uh, we, you know, the, once they had their strings out, they started having strings out that were called like the Schindler's Legato because it sounded like the Schindler's List mm. kind of um, quick uh, yet flowing sound, you know, that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, like I said, some trends actually are birth sample libraries rather than vice versa um so the latest trends we've been kind of trying to compile because it's difficult to tell in gay music because it follows hollywood music so uh well in some instances yeah. that it's difficult to tell the two apart so a lot of these are actually just general uh, they're trends. interrelated yeah. yeah um but the we always have mega horns that's yeah. the big one obviously from Hans zimmer and his Inception stuff. I mean, they probably existed before that, but he was the one that popularized the the mega horn. Well, I think that, that was definitely an important point in mm. in the life of the well, um, you know, a lot of that kind of spectrum of the hybrid instruments mm. revolves around that. You know, obviously Zimmer um, had these sounds that was kind of born out of the yeah. what he did with the um, Ith Piaf song, mm. um, slowing it down. But then, you know. That and uh, if we look at then Hybrid Tools Volume Two and the, from ADO, yeah, from ADO and the the kind of mega horn component mega of that, you know, that, they yeah. they are kind of very close to themselves in 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 kind of the t the time frame of things. Yeah, and, yeah, um, for sure. Uh, you know, we could uh, without kind of going too far off topic again. You know, we look at kind of that was reinforced by mm. trailer music. Yeah, leading yeah. out of that. Uh, yeah, trailer music yeah. in particular, scoring as well mm. on the whole, but um, oh, for sure, yeah. Yeah, well, Zimmer does a lot of the making the cookie, cook, uh, cookie cutters as opposed to using the cookie cutters. I mm. mean, uh, the Dark Knight Rises had the abstract percussion type stuff, which then became a thing in latest things. Mm. Um, like I said, mega horns already. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm going to guess that Philip Glass-esque minimalism will be a thing yep. very soon. Pipe um, organ, uh, yeah, thanks to Ostinati, Interstellar, yeah. which I wasn't a fan of, but uh, you know, the music was alright. <laughs> the music, I, I, I think that's an interesting case just mm. to kind of look at that one for a minute because I, I watched the movie first. Um, mm. I personally enjoyed the mu the movie. I know it's mm. a very polarizing one, mm. um, but I then got the soundtrack after that and listened mm. to it and. Um, like I think Zimmer's scores are interesting because listening to them in isolation, um, he's he's actually a very good film composer. Mm. Aside from all the other reasons, in the regards that you know that 
the the general kind of wisdom or mm. proverb, let's call it, of <laughs> of scoring music and film scoring in particular is that the best soundtracks are the ones you don't notice. Yeah. Uh, as much as we notice them because we are composers and we yeah. love the music. Um, I think when you listen to Hans Zimmer's music in isolation mm. outside of the movies, he does have a lot of cool layering and detail mm. in there that um, that you don't really pick up in the theatre. And that's one thing I really noticed with the Interstellar soundtrack. Um, you know, obviously you notice the organ straight mm. away in the movie and you notice his kind of usual uh, repeated ostinati thing mm. going on. Um, but there... Uh, as well, it was quite refreshing to hear, even though a lot of it is, is you know, very much strongly related to Glass. Mm. And if you, you look at particularly uh, his music from things like Koyana Scotsi, uh, mm. those kind of soundtracks, which really are uh, very similar mm. to, to uh, Zimmer's Interstellar, are very similar to them. Um, it was a refreshing sound in, in Hollywood. Um, mm. So it will be interesting to see over the next little yeah, bit, whether any of that pervades through, how much mm. of it kind of follows through. Yeah, I completely um, agree with all of that. I mean, my beef with Interstellar wasn't with the music. The music was really good. Yeah. It was the sound design and the uh, the oh, long-winded sure, yeah. uh, what is life type sound. <laughs> thing. I, I mean, in our group, I'm the sci-fi guy, effectively. I'm the guy who always wants to see all the spaceships exploding. But I didn't enjoy Interstellar, maybe, mainly because it was too philosophical for me. Mm. But uh, the sound design was also awful. It was probably the first movie i've come out and gone like man that's sound design jeez and uh, the, you can tell because you said that the you notice the organ but for me you notice the organ yeah i can hear the motorbike too it's very annoying um but, but for me i apologize for that yeah, that's all right. <laughs> but for me you notice the organ because that's literally all you can hear mm. even when people are talking um, so that was the problem I had. Like, yeah, sound design sure. was absolutely awful in the movie. But anyway, uh, yeah. other trends we can think of is the the latest thing is stuttered and gated risers. They're mm. always fun. The kind of the the, the typical riser, you know, yeah. or and but with a gate on it, so yeah. it cuts it on and off yeah. milliseconds at a time. <laughs> yeah, that that's that yeah. sort of sound. That's yeah. becoming quite popular now. There's always the low pulse thing that uh, gravity popularized mm. um, with the... Whoop, yeah. You know, and then other random stuff happening then on the beat. Whoop, yeah. And so on and so forth. Yeah, they're all very interesting trends which have... Um, what's the word? Spilt over into game music as well. Mm. I'm sure there's a few other things in indie stuff, but we're running out of time, so we're just going to keep on going for yeah. now. Um, so one of the last things we want to talk about is actually exceptions to this rule, because obviously cliches um, are how composers know how to write specific music for stuff, but sometimes these composers rewrite what the cookie cutter is. Yeah, they make a new cookie specific, cutter. Yes, yeah. for this specific cliche. So, uh, yeah, what's an example of a one that transcends the cliche? Well, I guess one. We'll, I guess we'll start with the one that we really wanted to jump into, mm. which is um, the soundtrack to Skyrim. Mm -hmm, um, for sure, you know, uh, a great, great game composer, uh, Jeremy Saul. Yep. Um, uh, uh, you know, we were we were kind of talking about this before working out, you know, how how we wanted to start and jump into this, and mm -hmm. I think the big thing for us was. Um, when we kind of went through the timeline and tried to pinpoint it, this was the big moment for us where the kind of uh, the important uh, elements of game music, the paradigm kind of shifted mm. with what he did with Skyrim. Um, mm. And this was the first kind of significant, well, not, not the first by any means, but mm. we'll say one of the, the more significant examples of um, where the the music was shifted away from mm. this kind of uh, melodic emphasis yeah. into this more atmospheric environmental thing and you know mm. i mean like the uh, you know born out of necessity i'm sure because uh, one one thing i will say is you know there's an amazing amount of music in mm. that game you know like we've we've both got the the, the cd signed the CDs. signed cd yeah. uh, cuz we we're, um, we're, we're very excited about that kind of thing but you know there's four cd's of music that came out of that game mm. three of them being kind of like scored um you know name tracks let's call them yeah um significant points and then like uh, the fourth cd is just an hour of atmospheres from the game mm. um 
you know, it's a, a f- I mean, firstly, it's a lovely soundtrack. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I do recall a lot of the music from it and yeah. there are some pieces that I really love in there. Um, but yeah, he, um, it's, it's an interesting one because we were talking before, I mean, you, you were mentioning before the kind of, um, the remnants, let's say, of the kind of ice cliche in there. Yeah, yeah. Well, because Skyrim's obviously just covered in snow. Mm. Um, so it's uh, the music kind of takes a back seat, I guess, rather than what you expect from, um, and we always come back to this, so I apologize, but Zelda music. Mm. Um, when you're out in the field, it's always like adventure, hurrah, dun, 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 dun. Whereas in Skyrim, it's a much more bleaker. Um, I wouldn't say sparser, but colder mm. sound, I guess. But at the same time, it's still very, very memorable. I think that's what really shifted the uh, the, the sound for fantasy games, at least. Sure. From yeah. the uh, epic sound, which epic sound still exists in Skyrim. I mean, the, the main theme is very opposite of what we're currently talking about. But the actual in-game music is uh, exactly what we're talking about. It shifted from this very melodious um heroic sound to this uh, atmospheric uh, fantasy sound hmm. which uh yeah which you see in practically everything fantasy wise these days bar a few things like dark souls and all that i mean um the latest one for me was witcher 3 hmm. when that came out i listened to the soundtrack i haven't unfor- I unfortunately haven't played the game yet but i listened to the soundtrack and there were some small bits where I was like, oh, that sounds really good. But a lot of it was literally just atmospheric. Mm. And it wasn't as atmospheric as or effective as Skyrim did it. So I was literally like, oh, this is a prime example of how Skyrim has affected future games. Yeah. Whoa. Better use this in the podcast. <coughs> well, I, I think, uh, you know, I think there's there's a lot to... Um, and again, you know, we, we, we can't really give this justice in mm. the time that we have to talk about it now, but... You know, it's it's an interesting comparison, and I think the the underlying thing for me with the Skyrim soundtrack and why it's kind of my pick mm-hmm. for for this this kind of topic is that underneath that, um, and you know, this is the strength of him as a composer mm-hmm. as well, is that you know there is still fantastic melodic content underneath that. You mm-hmm. know, whereas it's not it's not like the old style game music where the melody is blasted in your face mm-hmm. and it's the main focus of the music. You know, melody is still an important thing mm. in music, even if you're writing ambient music. Um, like, you know, I guess the the other example for me is, um, you know, obviously a big um, kind of creative force in in the ambient music scene overall was Brian Eno, mm-hmm. um, his his ambience albums that he made over the yeah. time. And even if you look back at the first one, Music for Airports, um, mm. there is I, I'd argue that there is a melody in those. Mm. And and to me, that's what Skyrim is. Um, there's you know there's tracks that I remember. Um, I think you know like my favorite uh, track from the from the game is um, is the one Secunda. Mm. I think it's Secunda, yeah. Um, which just has that kind of um, harp and piano combination. Yeah, I think I remember the. Yeah, I think I remember it. Oh no, no, I do remember. It. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, um, and you know, I, I did, I do remember that one vividly from the game as well. It wasn't from listening to the soundtrack. Mm. I remember because it, it always came through at a point where I was just kind of walking through the, you know, some part of the world, yeah. and it, and it came on and it, like it really struck me. But you know, that's that's still the mark of of good game music. You know, a, a less effective um, mm. music writing in this regard would be just kind of, you know an ambient music that doesn't have any content any you know content. material any yeah, content anything good in it yeah um, it's just sounds what, layered yeah and a musical term would be pads yeah it is it would essentially be that which which are used for padding as the name suggests yeah. rather than the actual rather than music. leading <laughs> yeah yeah uh, my favorite piece of skyrim is the city gates mainly because the first four notes from it are uh, the same from somewhere out there from american tale uh, so every time Fantastic I listen to it, movie. I always th- hum the tune <laughs> with the with the lyrics. Yeah, it's just, yeah. Uh, uh, the appropriate sentiment for Skyrim, maybe. But um, maybe. Yeah. Um. No, but that's a it's a good point. Um, yeah. Anyway, give me the second example. Yeah. So the got. the second example um, that I wanted to talk about, we're going a bit further back in time. Um, but I wanted to look at the talk a bit about the rare era games. So mm. we've talked a bit before. Um. A couple of pieces from Banjo Kazooie, but mm. that kind of era of game, um, mm. 
And it, I suppose Banjo Kazooie is a good one to take as an example because there are a lot of examples in those games of level design and world design that conforms to the traditional like themed areas. Yeah. So, you know, like you have your ice, your beach, your jungle, your yeah. whatever. Um, and one thing that I've always thought, I mean, I guess it's kind of the debate you could have with with these kind of games are. Is it just cliched music? Hmm. And I would argue no, because I, in my opinion, the, you know, they're very much, they conform to all the instrumentations we've hmm. talked about. You know, the, the music sounds exactly like what you'd expect it to for that hmm. point. But for me, it's kind of more, I'd call it more pastiche than cliche. Okay. Um, because Remind to, everyone what pastiche means. Yeah, so pastiche is just basically... Um, you know, you're you're deliberately referring to, yeah. uh, you know, whatever it is, a, a style, a thing, an object, yeah. whatever. Um, and to me, that's that's really the intent of those those uh, that music from those games mm. is to you know deliberately draw on these ex- expectations and these cliches. Yeah. And you know, again, you could get into a philosophical debate about whether that is just cliche in itself or mm. or not. But um, you know, I think it's an interesting example because. I know for the both of us, like we we absolutely love the music from Banjo Kazooie, oh, yeah, yeah, and sure. um, you know, there's a lot of it that we really enjoy. Mm. I think um, the rule is, uh, as I said, if you remember it, it's uh, one of those ones that moves beyond the cliche. Mm. But if it's good music, but you don't really remember it after X amount of months or so, then it's just cookie cutter music. Mm. And it's been nineteen uh, years, years, something and like years, that, since yeah. Banjo Kazooie. So, you know, that's clearly not <laughs> cliche to to the extent that we're talking about. It's not mm. cookie cutter. Um, yeah, so the, the rare exam- um, Grant Kirkhope stuff, David Wise, all the uh, Robin Beanland, and who was the other fourth guy? I can't remember the fourth guy's name, but he showed up in the Xbox era. That's right, yeah. Steve something. I don't remember. He did the cameo music. Oh, I'll, yeah, yeah, I'll yeah. look yeah. it up later. Um Ooh. But yeah, that, that's a good example. And a uh, final example will probably be Dead Space again, which we talked about loads, so we won't go into it again. But mm. they, yeah, that was one of the first um, games that went that whole aleatoric route, which we, again, we've already talked about. So mm. just rewind if you want to hear what we have to say about that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, and then like we briefly talked about any modern soundtracks, like literally this year, that have done that. Have they have any modern soundtracks ever... Um, transcended the cookie cutter idea and made a new cookie cutter mm. i mean i've had ideas but like a lot of them i've gone eh, not particularly i mean my first thought was bloodborne mm. straight up that was like maybe february march and that has a really good soundtrack like one of my favorite soundtracks of the past few years at least um but whether i would say it has uh set a new standard or uh, for this a specific genre not sure really because like i say it's really good I, I do remember it, but uh, yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't uh, feel like it feels unique rather than something that everyone will copy. I guess mm. if that makes any sense at all. Um, yeah, so there's that one. Uh, the, I'm sure some people argue which are three, but I'm going nope. That was Skyrim that uh, influenced that one. Um, never got a chance to play Batman because that that was PC and never it was dead now on PC mm. effectively. Which is a shame. Yeah, the 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 Batman game music was an interesting mm. one. I mean, you know, obviously we we're not really in a position to discuss Arkham Knight because mm. neither of us have played it. Yeah. Um, but you know, even looking back, I I remember a while ago I actually bought the soundtrack to Arkham City. Mm. Um, mainly out of interest. I think there were one or two little bits in the game that piqued my interest. Again, mm. I can't recall them now, so take from that what you will. Um, but uh, you know, like I guess. The soundtracks were quite interesting, but they probably were in the also the kind of unfortunate position of me. Like the, I whenever I think of Batman, I just think of the uh, recent Zimmer soundtracks to yeah. the Nolan movies, and that kind of, you mm. know, you can't really go past that. Yeah, um, that's it. He's he set the Batman sound. So yeah, you can't really. Yeah, use I, I that anymore. I guess um one other thing um that I've noticed recently. I mean, again, I'm the same. I don't think there are any sound checks recently to games that I've played mm. that have really leapt out at me or I've been like, wow, this is mm. like, this is the next thing. Um, but I think there are some cool examples I've played recently of games that um, they've, they've brought in something kind of 
that I haven't heard before in, yeah. in a game context, which I thought was quite interesting. And for me, the example that I was talking about just before, mm. um, I've played recently through the Talos Principle, that mm. puzzle game on PC, yeah. um, which is a fascinating game. It was quite interesting and, and a very good game for the puzzles and stuff. But one thing that um, really struck me about the music were there were things that I hadn't really... Well, I'm sure I've heard before in games mm. I'm you know I'm sure there's nothing new if you look through the the spectrum of of game music but um uh you know they they were kind of treated well and mm. uh, stuck out with me like the big one for me was the use of chant in the game there's one mm. one part of the game where you're in a kind of cathedral medieval setting mm. and um the the main part of the music is well there's like kind of bells and pads going underneath mm. but then there's this male chant voice um mm. over the top and it's the same that struck me because i was kind of sitting there thinking like i've i know that i've heard that in in games before to some mm. degree but that particularly was done quite well in that game mm. um the music in that game is interesting i won't go into it in more detail but you know i guess you could argue that it is a cliche but it was kind of fresh yeah, maybe. I mean, you said that... It, I haven't played Talos Principle, but you said that uh, it was in a castle area yeah. for that music, so that kind of fits for what it is. Yeah. Uh, but I'd actually have to listen to it to actually gauge a, a mm. decent opinion with that. Um, yeah, chanting and uh, lyric, actual lyrics, as opposed to the oh, 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 oh sound, um, has become more frequent. Bloodborne, yeah. for example, has uh, Latin lyrics about blood and spiders and stuff. Mm. Um, a good example of a, one which came out like a few weeks ago was Everyone's Gone to the Rapture. Mm. Like Jennifer Curry, I think the name of the composer is. Mm. I really hope that's the name of her name. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll look it up <laughs> um, and we'll correct ourselves if it's right. I think it's Jennifer yeah. Curry. Uh, she wrote a very uh, English pastoral type choral chant. Mm. Um, to, not chant, choral sound, uh, which, you know, you get a lot of sound, things like that from, um, I think, Farhan Williams is a good example of that sort of thing. Am I right in that? Yeah, Vormans, like you the, could also the look at... The English choral tradition. Oh, if, if you look at, like... The modern one, I'm talking about, modern, like, 20th century. Well, you can even look at, um, uh, like, Rutter and, and Yeah, other yeah, Rutter, yeah. that was the one that I should have thought of. Yeah. <laughs> Vaughan Williams, definitely, there's stuff yeah, there. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, yeah you know, that sound is there, and uh, that it, it's um, it's beautiful, first off. But I, I'm, I don't know, I'm torn between whether I would consider it a new standard of cookie cutter or whether it is a cookie cutter um because it's a very british sound but i think that's because i've listened to so much of von williams and rutter and all that mm. that that sound i'm just like oh it's it's the english countryside yeah <laughs> and straight up that's exactly where um everyone's gone to the rapture is based in mm. so I'm, yeah, I'm still torn. I'll, I'll consider that at a later date, whether that's uh, new. But it doesn't matter because it's a beautiful soundtrack anyway. Mm. So, yeah, we'll briefly do the... Um, we we don't hate cliches. We actually yeah. love them thing well, at the end. <laughs> well, again, you know, to take from that, and, you know, I haven't played played it yet. I haven't mm -hmm. played the game yet. But, um, you know, at, at the end of the day, you're in the you're meant to be in the countryside. Mm. So, you know... Uh, we, you know, we're saying like we don't hate cliches, and is it really a bad thing if if she's written the music mm. that immediately evokes that feeling? You know, yeah. I'd say it's probably even if you want to call it cliche, mm. it's it's effective writing because mm. it does what its intention is or what it's mm. supposed to do. Um, I think we just need to wait a few months and see what happens with uh, the next few games that come out because yeah. if people start copying it, then yeah, great, it, it is a cookie cutter. Mm. And I think if we're gonna call dead space like the new a new cookie cutter we need to call everyone's gone to the rapture a new cookie cutter because mm. dead space just copied penderesky we're well, not copy but uh heavily influenced Influence, by yeah. uh penderesky which was in the 1960s uh and so if we're letting that be a, a unique thing then we will let uh, everyone's gone to the rapture to be a unique thing as well mm. there was one more game i wanted to talk about which is splatoon but uh you know i don't really have much to say now that we've uh 
exhausted a lot of our time. Yeah, we we kind of had that one as a reserve, admittedly. I think. Yeah. But, um, yeah. I, good punk music. So. Yeah, good music, but I think it's harder to apply to other games as mm. well. It's kind of a less traditional. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's it's a, music. quite a unique game yeah. in itself, so I think the music has to be unique, yeah. I guess. But but check it out. Have a listen for yourself and see mm, what you think. Mm. Yeah, so that should be it for this uh, talk. Essentially, uh, cliches are good. We may sound like we hate them, but they're actually good for yeah. both newcomers and uh, veterans and all that. It helps shape what game music is effectively in certain areas. Yeah. And then there are great examples of uh, people creating new cliches mm. that just end up everyone hating, like Megahorns. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I kind of add, add a kind of... Mm. Uh, whatever to that you know cliches are good but we always have to kind of be be conscious of them and remember where they've come from yeah. so that we use them properly and, yeah. and don't rely on them as you know use them as the tool that they are mm -hmm. that they exist as rather than as just a crutch to you know kind of m make up for having yeah. to yeah. to right well yeah yeah that's it if you if you want to do all right just stick to the cliche but if you want to do well uh, see if you can make your own mm. cliche or, or evolve the cliche to the next level, I guess. Yeah, so yeah. That, that'll be it. All right. So, um, yeah, we got, uh, as we've said many times, we've got plenty of other uh, things to talk about in future podcasts. Um, like was, there was the lazy composing thing we discussed. Um, there are yeah. others which there I've are others. No, we, We've also Get looked at a few. I, I know that like we've, We've won we we might spend a few more times kind of looking at broad topics on the mm -hmm. podcast, but I know that both of us eventually as well want to get kind of down into more detail. Mm. Um, whether we isolate particular games or mm. composition techniques or genres mm. or whatever. Um, but we will we'll keep you informed once once we've decided what we're going to record next yep. and we've got a plan together. We'll um mm. yeah we'll work that out. Yeah, we um, also have the Let's Plays continuing. We're yeah. almost done with Pikmin. Nearly done. Um, Thank. Should really start the piece for that. Yeah, or each other's pieces. <laughs> Likewise, um, but yeah, no, that that will be up, so you can watch me continue to be uh, quite incompetent at picking. Yep. Uh, and, <laughs> and then Sintone, like we've essentially finished the album, so well, it'll be released before this anyway. So yeah, you will be able to hear it mm. by the by the time you've heard this. It'll be out by like two weeks. Sure. <laughs> by the time you've heard this, so yeah, that we also need to start thinking about what else we're going to do with Sintone in that regard, yeah. like a new album of some sort. Uh, we'll talk about that off mic. So yeah, yeah thanks for listening. Thanks for li we'll uh, yeah. catch you next time. See you later.